And uh, I saw Penny uh, in the chat. Do you want to make her a uh, presenter? Yes, I will. This is amazing. We have folks joining from California, Vermont, uh, New York, Washington, DC, Tennessee, Massachusetts. So thank you all for joining us this evening. Aloha from Hawaii. Thank you for joining. We're so excited to Great. have all of you tonight. I'll just give two more minutes before we kick off. Great. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for all for joining the United Nations Association of USA for our global engagement online series today. Uh, it is a semi monthly program that connects member um, of public to high level UN and US officials to discuss our world's most pressing issues. Today, we'll be focusing on achieving an equal future in a COVID-19 world. My name is Ada and I'm a Global Goals Ambassador at UNA USA. I'm passionate about uh, gender equality and development of SDG goal number five, particularly focusing on programming and communication at the national level. As Global Goals Ambassadors, we work alongside with UNA staff and other volunteer leaders to promote SDGs through blog posts and UNA forum articles, attendance and representation at events and the creation of national events like this one you're in today. During the month of March, we focus on SDG 5, gender equality, and we celebrate International Women's Day and the start of the 65th session of the Commission on the Status of Women. As Secretary General Antonio Guterres stated during his International Women's Day address, whether running a country, a business, or a popular movement, women are making contributions that are delivering for all and driving progress towards sustainable development goals. This past year, not only seeing the devastating effects of a global pandemic, but also a critical setback in women's progress in terms of economic and workplace empowerment. As it relates to representation in government, only 7.3 of the world's heads of government are women. Related to SDG 15, land on, a life on land, nearly 37 of employed women are working in agriculture, forestry, and fishers but only 14 of landholders globally are women. More than 11 million girls are at risk of not returning to school because of COVID and an inherent challenge to global goals number four, quality education. And globally, women have a 27% higher risk than men of facing severe food insecurity. So during our session today, we will learn from women leaders from various sectors, sharing their impact and solutions to create opportunities for women during and after the impact of COVID-19. Now, please allow me to introduce my fellow ambassador and the moderator for our event today, Nekpan Oswan Wilson. Nekpan is the co-founder and CEO of Women's Empowerment Nonprofit at Women Work, the largest nonprofit focused on women of color in New York City. She's also a certified executive and career coach training with the Muse and Win Summit. Nekpan leverages her decade of experience as a strategist and women's rights advocate in her role as a Global Goals Ambassador for SDG5, empowering women and girls globally. Her work and impact has been recognized across renowned conference stages, including the White House, Vital Voices, the DNC Women's Leadership Forum, Blogger, Win Summit, the National Urban League and the Council of Urban Professionals. She graduated from Columbia and Baylor University with honors 
and is an avid runner, mentor, and connector of powerful women. Nekpen, I will hand it over to you now. Thank you so much, Ada. It is a joy to join this amazing panel today. Um, as Ada mentioned, I also serve as ambassador for SDG5 with UNA USA. We're so excited to see such a large gathering of folks across the United States as the UN is elevated this week and every month um, for the important work we do globally. Today, I have some representative women who are going to speak to our important theme tonight, creating economic opportunities in a COVID-19 world. As many of you know, the last year has ravaged women, not only in terms of loss of work, but a lot of women who run small businesses have been challenged by the global halt of the pandemic. Our speakers today are Penny Ander Abed Wardina, the New York City Commissioner for National Affairs, Barbara Benitez, a professor at George Washington University and a renowned international journalist, Jessica Burke Ross, who's a managing partner at Finn Partners, Jacqueline Ebanks, the Director for the Commission on Gender Equality for the City of New York, and Christy Wallace, President of the Elevate Network. She also partners with Elvest. Today, I really want our speakers to share their unique backgrounds. Each woman is leading in a different sector. They're providing perspective tonight that we hope can empower the work you're doing locally in your chapters. We also invite you to stay connected with them so that you can continue to learn about this topic beyond tonight's conversation. So first, it's my pleasure to introduce our very first speaker, Penny Aberwardina. Penny, we're really excited to have you. Penny is going to be spot lit and she'll speak today about the importance of creating global policies that empower women in every sector. As I mentioned earlier, she's New York City's Commissioner for International Affairs. And as the city's hey babe, you're gonna ambassador, now, okay? she leads the largest dip. No worries. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so <laughs> you're fine, Penny. It happened. Work that was really to, that was to um, my four-year-old. So this is just where we are right now. And we are all doing this from home. So thank you for exposing motherhood and its reality for us all. <laughs> Not a big deal. Um, Penny leads the, the agency that has the largest diplomatic core working with ambassadors across the globe. She was appointed in September 2014 and has worked with the Merit's Office of International Affairs to successfully implement a series of initiatives and programs with international community, including youth empowerment and leadership at local and um, federal levels. She's been rebuilding the city with the mayor throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. From 2009 to 2014, she served previously at the Clinton Global Foundation as Director of Girls and Women Empowerment, where she led the program's evolution, which I was a part of <laughs> and was really proud to see. Um, one of the largest of scale of CGI's initiatives. Penny's impact has been recognized in various ways, including being selected a French American Foundation Young Leader in 2017, a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader in 2016, and co-chair of West Global Future Council on Cities. Welcome, Penny. Thank you so much and apologies again for um, reality coming in and I wish we were in person. Um, I wanna thank you and Ada for um, uh, having us all here tonight. It's a pleasure to be on the virtual stage with um, the fellow panelists, including um, my sister Jackie um, from New York City. So what I wanted to share um, with the audience or the, the community that came in, um, especially because of the connection to the UN, how important the sustainable development goals have been SDG five in terms of how we are getting through COVID-19 and how we're gonna rebuild um, better. So I have um, the honor of being the commissioner for international affairs and just as some background, New York City is host to the largest diplomatic corps. So not only do we have the UN we have 193 permanent missions. There's just such a robust um, diplomatic and international community in New York City. And so back in 2015, um, my office, um, you know, as the global community was coming together around the SDGs, 
what we did was we um, mapped the synergies between what we were doing in New York City to the SDGs. And we had um, synergies in all of them just because of the very strong equity lens that we had um, in, uh, in New York City with the de Blasio administration. And through that sort of the, the synergy and the mapping, we realized there was a real opportunity um, to showcase how we were localizing the SDGs and to create a platform from which we could exchange best practices with other um, with other cities and states. And this is particularly true and relevant um, in the gender equity space. And so fast forwarding to, to COVID-19, it became very important. Um, you know, we saw our most vulnerable communities um, get hit the hardest. Um, these are our black and brown communities. Um, so many women, I mean, we all know the stats, I think in the US, the majority of women that um, have, or the majority of people that have left um, the workforce have been women. And so we really leaned into this platform, this connectivity that we have with the global community to be able to exchange best practices and to be able to, at the end of the day, accelerate what's happening in our community by connecting and learning with our counterparts um, from our counterparts around the world. Um, you know, something that we did last year during, during COVID was host um, an event with the Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed um, and our office to address gender-based violence because it was so important um, for uh, the Deputy Secretary General and her team um, around the world to hear about how we shifted all of our services online. And this is just one of many examples and I don't wanna go into them in too much detail because Jackie really has led so much work, but I think what I just really want to, you know, sort of um, share with your team has just been the importance of city leadership, of local government leadership over the last few years, and how that really came um, to be front and center during, uh, during uh, COVID-19. I think, um, you know, I saw as people are checking in where they are, it's all around the country, and we have really experienced um, a federal government over the past few years abdicating their responsibility. And this is where cities have really leaned in and shown the kind of leadership they can show on a number of different fronts, but in particular gender equity. And that is something I will say, um, Jackie and I have the pleasure of working with a proudly feminist mayor. Um, for much of his two terms, um, the majority of people running the city of New York have been women. Um, and that has really um, reflected in the kinds of policies that my team gets to amplify and promote globally. And this has everything to do with early childhood education, um, New York City created one of um, the first uh, pre-K that's, you know, programs, uh, putting about 70 or 80,000 four-year-olds to school. Um, and you know who that benefits. Um, it benefits um, moms and single moms. And so um, it's been a pretty um, incredible opportunity, I think, at the end of the day to showcase how the impact of what we're doing here um, in New York City and locally um, matters globally. And, uh, you know, for, for this community that's come together, I just want to just remind everybody while we're stuck at home and, you know, in our communities, the kind of impact we have here really has global resonance. And before I wrap up, I just want to talk about one other program that my office runs, and it's called our Junior Ambassador Program. Um, this has been to ensure that um, New Yorkers, um, New York youth around our five boroughs, um, those from underserved communities have had a chance to connect with the UN um, and learn about the SDGs. And many of them choose SDG 5 to focus on. And what's so powerful is that they learn about how they are part of a global community of activists working on SDG 5. But what we teach them is at the end, the most important thing they can do is activate on SDG 5 um, in their communities. And so this is just really a call to action um, for everyone that's joining that even while we're stuck in our virtual world, we have so much um, ability to be an, act, an activist um, to make change in our community. And COVID has shown how important um, our actions are right now. Thanks, Nekpen. Thank you so much, Penny. We really appreciate the work you're doing in your not only as host to the UN, but across the globe in your partnership. Our next speaker is Jacqueline Ebanks. Jacqueline serves as the executive director of the New York City Commission on Gender Equity. She's an innovative leader and policymaker with over 30 years of experience advocating for women, girls, and marginalized community. From 2014 to 2017, she served 
I served as the city's executive director for the Women's City Club of New York, where she guided engagement initiatives and activism. Previously, she was the vice president of programs for the New York City Women's Foundation and worked at Citigroup as the vice president and director of US partnerships and program development. Jacqueline has began her career as a citywide employee working for the Child Welfare Policy Agency as an analyst. And she worked closely with the Federation of Protest Welfare Agencies and Staff Development and Human Resource Management Initiatives. Thank you, Jackie, for joining. I know your team has been working on gender equity and promoting that across New York City and across the globe. We're excited to hear from you today about how we can more equitably about the work ahead. Thank you so much for having me, Nick Penn and Ada. It is a wonderful opportunity. I'm, I'm really honored to sit on this uh, esteemed panel and really to share the stage with my forever friend, sister colleague, Penny Abiwardena. Um, as you said, I'm executive director of New York City's Commission on Gender Equity. We are that entity in the de Blasio administration that works across city agencies to break barriers to equity for all New Yorkers, regardless of gender identity, gender expression, or background. And we have three areas of focus, economic mobility and opportunity, health and reproductive justice, and safety. Within that, those three frames, we operate with an intersectional lens and we also recognize the diversity of gender. Today, I wanna to talk to you about the impact of COVID-19 on women in terms of employment. And um, what we have seen is that the pandemic and its resulting economic crisis exacerbated long-standing inequalities faced by women, particularly women of color and immigrants. And we get to look at how this, this uh, exacerbation of these inequalities play out in, in the lives of women and the diverse nature of this impact and the complexity and the challenges that women uh, are dealing with as a result. And I, you know, as I mentioned, we have to keep the intersectional frame alive as we move, right? Because how race interacts with age, interacts with um, ability, interacts with socioeconomic status, it varies. And so we really want to be mindful of that. And so there are three conditions that I, if, if I, three buckets that I put our population in when I thought about this women and work during the pandemic. I thought about the essential worker category where those are the women who kept us afloat, right? Who made sure that I was able to go to my grocery store, even though I had to stand six feet apart from my next, the next customer, even though I had to have a mask, I could in my community in the Northeast Bronx, know that my grocery store was open and I was able to function, but they were highly vulnerable and their families were compromised because they were at greater risk and longer exposure in terms of the pandemic and, and, and the vulnerability. So their health was high at risk. They're also the least well paid and our entire nation, and I say across the globe, depended on those individuals keeping the doors open. A large proportion of our essential workers were um, our women. Let's not forget the medical community at the other end who had to deal with the trauma of the pandemic themselves and the vulnerabilities of their families. And so uh, those, that's the span of the essential worker category and the diversity within that category. I wanna also think about the work from home population. And it, the complexity in that population you know, various, you know, Penny <laughs> and her wonderful four-year-old son, right? Was sort of a snapshot into that, the, the challenges of that. And the fact that school um, was now at home. Work is at home, school's at home, home's at home, and everybody's at home. And what we do know at the center of that is that women are caretakers. And so the doubling down on the caretaker role for many folks who worked at home was a great complexity to this pandemic. And then we want to think about the unemployed 
the newly unemployed as a result of the pandemic and what that meant to so many households in terms of stability, it, what that means to single mothers and single families, uh, women, single female headed households. And I really think that adds a unique com complexity. And so we realized that the pandemic impacted women greatly. We talk about this she session, but we also recognize we're not a monolith, right? That the diversity of the experience is, is, is significant and dare I say tremendous. And let's add to that, that we really need to be mindful of the most vulnerable, those already marginalized in populations when things are normal. Uh, a homelessness population in New York City at this time of over 60,000 individuals, including women and families, the formerly incarcerated and the currently incarcerated, just unique vulnerabilities and women occupy um, percentages of those populations as well. If we fast forward and when we fast forward as we now have the vaccine and we're talking about recovery, we're becoming more intentional. Um, the pandemic underscored the importance of policies that support families and support caregiving. And what is essential in our advocacy moving forward is that we become extreme activists for universal health care, for universal child care, that we need to have paid sick and safe leave really as underpinnings of our society, that the minimum wage being raised in this country to $15 an hour is an essential goal in order to have economic security so that we can save when times are good, to be prepared for times that will be not as good. And we know that more and more that will happen. And last but not least, we really have to look at closing the gender and racial pay gaps. Um, I think if we can build a network um, and in essence sort of create that safety net against elevating the floor, we may have a strong, stronger chance as a society to be able to meet the next um, crisis with, um, with more success. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, I really appreciate the intersectionality of her work and the topics that you raised as key policies. Um, the UN shares many of those areas as uh, part of our SDG um, goals broadly. Uh, I do have a question for you um, and I wanna encourage everyone else, please feel free to enter any questions in the Q&A feature. Uh, my question to you is, as one of the largest cities um, employing service workers, right? I would imagine across the nation. And we know disproportionately service workers tend to be female, tend to be of color. Um, when you think about the shift economically that COVID has had, um, you know, what is the city looking to do uh, to get people either back to work or retooled or reskilled? And, and how does your work in equity kind of uh, touch on some of the other agencies that are in the city of New York, but also probably representative of other government models? Right. I mean, I want to say that a key tenet of the de Blasio administration is collaboration. And one of the uh, things that uh, the mayor instituted shortly after the pandemic launch was the Task Force on Racial Inclusion and Equity, immediately upon recognizing the huge disparities. And so every city agency has representatives at that table. And we're constantly, as we respond to the crisis and as we look our way out, equity, as Penny said, is, a, is the centerpiece, right? And so we have identified our most vulnerable communities and even went a little deeper to the communities that are not as vulnerable, but on that tipping point. And we have identified the, about 30 or so that we have deep investment in. So as a city, whenever we roll out an initiative, we are guided by the work of this task force on racial inclusion and equity. And so when you hear about vaccines and, and you'll hear, you know, we talk about an equitable distribution of our vaccines, right? We prioritize essential workers right up front. This is something that this administration has been ever so mindful of and very disciplined. And so across the board, equity is the mantra and um, inclusivity, I would also say is the mantra. And so, um, you know, we're looking and we're building and the mayor has called the recovery a recovery for all. So that lens of equity and inclusivity is wedded in. And we just go wherever we're asked to go 
and that that's the same for Penny as well, because that's the nature of our collaboration and, and the team that the mayor has built. Can Thank I add so one bit to that? that? Yes, please, Penny, go ahead. Um, because that that's at the heart of it is absolute is a collaboration. And she mentioned the task force, and that is a level of thoughtfulness and being deliberate that this recovery for all is really also skewed towards addressing the fact that we recognize which communities got hit. And so, you know, what last spring, we had to shift all of our priorities into four basics, which was ensuring that everybody had housing, safety, access to healthcare and security. And that meant that we were taking very specific policies and services and resources to those communities. Now we've had a year into it and we continue to go into it with our um, access to vaccinations. But I think it's that larger you know, collaboration based on a strategic focus on that community. That's the reason I think we're gonna be able to, to really address this moving forward. Yeah, I love that. This idea that we have to be intentional, right? When we sort of build without an intentional intersectional lens, we see the biases come out of the outcomes of policy. So thank you very much for that great addition. Thank you, Jackie, for speaking. We're so excited you were able to join. I'm going to move to our next speaker in the interest of time. And I did see a question in the Q&A. So Christy, I'm going to put that your way after your remarks, if that's OK. Um, I'm excited to introduce my good friend, Christy Wallace. Christy serves as the president and CEO of Elevate Network and is responsible for Elevate's strategic mission of changing the culture of business by creating professional women communities and supporting women in their Christy also is the host of Elevate's amazing podcast called Conversations with Women, Changing the Face of Business. She's a regular speaker on leadership, diversity, social entrepreneurship, networking, and entrepreneurialism. Most recently, she was recognized by Women of Influence as a woman of influence, excuse me, by the Business Journal. Christy strives to support women and girls in every aspect of her work. She's an angel investor for Pipe Angels, and she's also a member of the UN Global Initiative Collaboration. Christy's a graduate of Villanova University, and she began her career as an analyst at KeyBank. Thank you so much for joining us, Christy. We're excited to hear how your work has been reshaping business and creating communities of women. Thanks for having me here. Uh, I know we're at the midway point, so if anyone needs to like shake a little bit or you know move your body, get some energy going, let's make it happen. We want this uh, to be a really powerful conversation. It already is. And I'm honored to be here today to talk a little bit about building communities. Uh, building communities, particularly as we look at women in the workplace, is critically important. Research shows that women need two communities. One, that deep squad, those people that they can turn to. And just like Jacqueline talked about equal pay, say, okay, how much are you making? How much should I ask for? Let's role play how I negotiate that raise. All of that information that we need to continue moving forward, to succeed, to have that support. We need those, those deep networks and relationships. But it's also the breadth of community that we tap into that will give us access to opportunities, to advisors, board roles, job opportunities. Those are the things that keep us moving forward. When so many women are, have left the workforce or lo lost their jobs during this time, we want to make sure we can get them back into the workforce and having that breadth of network is important. But to do that, we need to first really redefine what networking is. It's oftentimes seen as transactional. It's seen, seen as a little bit kind of dirty. A lot of people say, well, that's not for me. But I wanna reframe that. I think building networks, building communities is about giving. It's about giving back. It's about giving that support, giving that advice, making sure that everyone that you are connected to can benefit from those relationships. At Elevate, one example that we've seen that's really worked is our squads program. Squads are a 12-week long program where women meet online for half an hour a week with a small group of 68, 68 peers. Why this matters is each woman has her hot seat. It's one week in which she's there specifically to talk about what she needs, to share with the group the challenges she's facing, the opportunities she's pursuing, 
and to really flex that muscle about making the ask. And everyone there is there to give and to support. We've had over 8,000 women go through this program and over 80% have said they are more confident in their career and that directly correlates to career progress and success. So one thing as we look at this virtual landscape of community building is how do we build those deep support networks and provide access to those opportunities. The other thing that has really worked is to make it accessible. We live in a time where we're the boundaries of work and life have been re removed. Many of us have more uh, weight on our shoulders, more things we're working through. And so making networking accessible for all is critically important. Things that we've seen have worked is you know, ensuring that the ROI on that time is worth it. That when you're there, that is time well spent. That's gonna help you move ahead. Consistency and format and date and time. For example, I lead, lead an executive round table every single Tuesday at 2 p.m. I see the same faces every week and it is powerful and it is amazing because we are in those one hour having expert led discussions around the challenges we face as executive leaders and how we continue to support one another in moving forward. We do that for business owners, for managers, looking across the spectrum of business, how are you building those meaningful conversations, where, meeting them where they are and making sure it's relevant and it's accessible. But community is about intentionality as well. Being intentional that the community you're tapped into is diverse. Diversity of thought, of experience, of identity, of industry, of geography. This is a unique opportunity in this virtual landscape for us to break down some of the boundaries that maybe had kept us back before and to leverage bigger communities and global communities to tap into that wealth of knowledge and experience. It matters. But it also say it's about the intentionality of who aren't you seeing every day. Many of us were building relationships at events. We might have been, you know, running into someone on the way to uh, lunch or in the cafeteria, building those informal connections. That's mentorship, that's sponsorship, that leads to opportunities and so much more. And so I encourage everyone to really be intentional about who aren't you seeing, who's not there, who's missing from your network, and how do you proactively ensure that you're building those relationships? It might just be, you know, sending an email or a note or a quick coffee meetup. But in this virtual landscape, making sure that we're continuing to build relationships matters. And we need to really lean into what's working and keep it going. We're not going to go back to the big networking events, the business cards, we'll probably never go back to that. But it's about where are we going? What is the future? of building communities and of building relationships. There's things that have always been central to communities. It's that depth, it's that relationship, it's that support and being a giver. It's that intentionality of who's there and how we're building those synergies, those relationships, that consistency of experience and touch points. Many of us here today are community builders. We care deeply about the places where we live and where we work. And so I encourage you to really think about how this translates to this virtual space now and in the future. And it comes back to really understanding the depth of relationships matters, the breadth of relationships matters. And there's many ways to build that if you focus on consistency and intentionality and ensuring that you're giving the most value you can. It's about giving and really supporting one another now and into the future. Amazing. Thank you, Christy. Um, I totally can echo that. And growing my nonprofit women work, uh, the power of relationships has been invaluable. I can't even speak. So I've, I've learned from you as my mentor to, to always make sure you're, you're getting offering and leaning into others and you'll see the, the rewards of that. I want to ask you a question in the Q&A chat, which talks about a gender role. As you know, as you mentioned, our home life and our work life are blurred. Um, a lot of people are with family or in relationships, whatever that dynamic looks like, where it feels that um, gender equality might have taken a step back. Uh, mothers are caring more for kids. Uh, 
partners and spouses may have a balance. What advice would you have for those who want to advocate in their own homes for greater balance and equity to empower women? Yeah, I mean, it's it's an important question and, and not necessarily one um, that's easy to answer because I think it's very multifaceted. Speaking as someone who is CEO of a company, but also a mom to three kids uh, who are all under the age of 11 and homeschooled, I can assure you that um, there, I'm wearing a lot of hats right now. And it, I'm, for many of us, has is a struggle. And we feel that some of those gender roles and progress has moved backwards, not just in the home, but in the workplace and in society. And I say that it is a challenging question to answer because I think it's multifaceted. You know, we need to look at companies and corporate structures that have been put into place um, in terms of how caregivers are supported and valued, um, how are we as, as business leaders um, creating environments of flex work, you know, acknowledging that caregivers have responsibilities, um, ensuring that those voices are included. When we talk about culture, when we talk about policies, if you look at only 17% uh, of business leaders are women and who's making those decisions, we need a lot of work around uh, diversity within the workplace, uh, support for caregivers, but that's not just within the corporate realm that's looking at policy as well. I know there have been some really important policies that have been put forth over the past few months. Um, Meshma came out with the Marshall Plan for Moms, which is really about acknowledging and supporting working moms. Uh, there's many other policies and initiatives from the city, state to federal level, which is really understanding the role of caregivers within our society and how we best support them. But when you talk about the deep, uh, you know, gender roles um, within our homes, you know, that's going to take more. It's looking at media representation. It's looking at the conversations we're having on stages like this. We need to support one another um, in really breaking down some of these uh, stigmas and really creating a deeper understanding of where we go from here um, and how city, state and communities uh, and workplaces come together to break down some of these barriers and to move forward. Thank you so much, Christy. We really appreciate that. Um, it is a very tough question. It's so deeply personal. I know even in my household, having conversations with my partner has been really challenging. Having conversations with my boss about how I manage time to make time for family has been also very interesting. So it is multifaceted. So thank you for that. Um, our next speaker is Barbara Benitez. Uh, Barbara is going to be speaking to us about media representation and the power of representing women's stories equitably. She's, the international, she's an international news journalist with a long history of producing award-winning video content as well as original content. I'll let you Google her after this to see all the amazing work she's done. She's actually part of the launch family and team that started Al Jazeera International, um, the English language channel in the US based out of Washington, DC and has worked at CNN International in Atlanta. She's received a Peabody, a national headliner award, and she's participated in so large stories covering the Asian tsunami, Hurricane Katrina, and the war in Iraq. While at Al Jazeera, she produced a report series in the jungles of Mosquito Coast, Nicaragua, a small town in South America. She's also led a role in planning coverage for things like the United Nations General Assembly. She's a senior producer for Talk to Al Jazeera and has coordinated interviews with many great leaders, including the late Republican John McCain and media critic, linguist, uh, Naomi Chomsky. She's an assistant professor at the George Washington University School of Media and Public Affairs. And outside of teaching, she enjoys writing and producing documentaries and other journalistic projects. Thank you, Barbara, for joining us. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, thank you so much. I want to first of all thank UNA USA for inviting me to speak today. Uh, in listening to all of you women, you've made some incredibly important points, which kind of tie into what I want to speak to. Um, namely, Jacqueline uh, discussed the importance of information and where it comes from. And Christy mentioned representation. Um, we've seen 
areas of improvement, areas that I would call green shoots of late, but there truly still needs more to be done. And that's what I wanna address um, today. Uh, first, I do want to talk about the good things and the accomplishments that have been covered that uh, women have faced, especially as it ties to COVID, as well as, as other enormous changes that have helped to move the needle toward progress forward. Um, as the world faces these issues that we've all heard about um, brought on by COVID, women continue to play an enormous role in moving that needle forward. Um, I was reading a recent Forbes article that listed, you know, the world's most powerful women of 2020 and some of the notable ones. I mean, in the U.S. alone, we have the first woman vice president, one of the highest offices ever held, as well as being a woman of color um, and maybe not so high up as far as uh, politicians are concerned, but women like Stacey Abrams, who worked tirelessly to shift a red state to blue. And what does that mean in the realm of politics? We're seeing changes now when it comes to COVID that we hadn't seen in previous administrations. And it's a role that women are playing that maybe they don't get the um, kudos that they should do in mainstream press, but it is there nonetheless. Outside of the US, women leaders have led the charge. For example, uh, New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern she kept COVID at bay. She's gotten incredibly positive global press over her response to the crisis in the country. Um, and in the media landscape itself, there are so many notable women in front of, as well as behind the scenes, although not enough. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But, you know, women filmmakers, one of my favorites, Miss um, Ava DuVernay, who creates amazing entertainment, as well as documentaries that are unflinching and look at issues of social justice and the need for change. If anybody has not seen 13th or the Emmy nominated when they see us, they are absolute Netflix streaming must-sees for anyone in the audience out there. Um, we've seen social media play a huge role in putting women together to raise their voice. Uh, in 2017, we had the Women's March, which was one of the biggest protests in US history. So my point being, We've also seen Me Too, which has pushed aside a renowned you know, sexual predator in the world of media. Um, we've seen women, when they band together and they make the choice to be heard, make that change. But as I said, more needs to be done. We need to hear more stories about women. Um, in the past, we've had limited arenas, but now we have multiple platforms. We have social media. Christy has a podcast. There are several other podcasts where women can get their voices heard, where women can get their stories told. Um, streaming platforms, for example, Netflix. Actually, um, a report, it came out this February, so it's very current, because I was looking through all the reports to see where are we now? One would think that women have progressed greatly when it comes to representation in the media. It's happening, but it's happening at a slower pace than I'm sure all of us here would like to see. For example, um, Netflix, one of the leading streaming platforms we all know of, has opened up opportunities for women. And I had a slide I wanted to share briefly on this because I think it's important if I could find it without making a mess. Um, it was done by Annenberg uh, School of Communications, renowned School of Communications um, in, in the University of Southern California. We can see in small indicators here that like in 2018, there were only 46%, for example, overall of women in behind the scenes as well as in the front through streaming, more and more characters, directors, stories written by women have increased to at least 52%. So we're breaking that halfway point, which um, is improvement, but I feel there are still many areas where improvement can happen, particularly when it comes to journalism. Um, Jack Jacqueline spoke to the fact that information, where do we get information? Obviously news is supposed to be the source of information for all for women in need. Yet when COVID first hit, there were reports by women scientists stating the need for more women scientists' voices out in the media. It was predominantly a male-driven narrative. So why is this important? Obviously, 
media is where we get our main form of information. We see representation. We see issues um, still that need to be dealt with. We're in 2021. I mean, when you think about it, we're in 2021. Um, this is not 1950 anymore. It's beyond time to move this needle of progress and end the men's club that has existed, particularly with media. We still see stereotypes. We still see sexual uh, exploitation of young women. We see the disappearance of aging women. You know, post 40, you're ghosted. And at the end of the day, we're here. We have a voice. We have wisdom. Um, and you know, even though in, when it comes to corporate America, particularly advertising, there's been a lot more improvement that's been done. However, when it comes to the workplace, there's women still face hostility there. There's still a glass ceiling that prevents them from reaching leadership roles that needs to be dealt with. Um, again, I, I emphasize media is our main source of information. If we don't look at these issues, we are going to see women through a man's lens. And again, it is so important to be able to have our voices heard. Um, I wanna talk a moment about journalism and I know we, we're getting short of time, so I'm gonna be quick here, but when it comes to journalism, it's particularly important because we all know that's where we get our information. Um, fully diverse and inclusive journalism is what helps societies to thrive. Um, we definitely need journalism to have a well-functioning democracy. But when it comes to journalism, it's still very much a man's world, especially when it comes to leadership. Um, there's a lot of women journalists and we are seeing the change, but um, using COVID as an example, since I know we're all speaking about COVID here, um, media coverage of COVID issues has been limited when it comes to stories about women. Um, women provide, as you all spoke, spoke to earlier, at least 70% of healthcare globally, yet there's still disparity um, in, in what we're hearing. Um, I feel like I'm running out of time, so I don't want to keep going on and on because I know I don't I certainly don't want to leave Jessica out this time either <laughs> because I know she uh, she felt left out in another conversation. So <laughs> I want to make sure that we leave room. But I do want to wrap up by saying it is absolutely imperative to have more women's voices in media. It's absolutely imperative that accurate portrayals and we can tell our own stories. We are the only ones that can tell these stories. Um, we need more discussions about this, uh, more social media campaigns if need be. Um, and I believe then we'll start to see more progress and more change in the coming years. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, I wanted to thank you for your holistic approach because I know media is wide ranging, it's diverse, it's deep. It is every day in our lives. So that was a great great summary of just key points we should keep in mind. Um, yeah, someone in the um, Q&A asked if you could please drop the two films in the chat you mentioned and everyone can take a look at them. Yeah, and have an opportunity to view them and um, really learn from what you've referenced. So thank you very much for that. Um, so our final speaker at the least is Jessica Burke Ross. Jessica is a managing partner and been um, managing partner at Finn Partners in Washington, DC, where she leads the agency's global public affairs practice. Jessica brings more than 30 years of experience blending political public affairs and public relations experience into winning communication strategies for her clients. Jessica provides strategic counsel on multi-channel communications with a special focus on public affairs, which is the intersection of and government. She serves on the Finn crisis team, a cross-functional team of experts, that helps in moments of crisis and issue management. Her experience is diverse and she offers support through um, complex situations, including negative media, government investigations, and congressional inquiries. Jessica is basically Olivia Pope in DC. <laughs> She's worked across sectors to help organizations build their strategies and manage their relationships. Um, she began her career on Capitol Hill and earned her master's in legislative affairs at George Washington University, where she's currently a faculty member at the School of Media and Business, Media and Public Affairs. She teaches communication strategy, crisis management, and media ethics. Thank you for joining us, Jessica.
It, it's my pleasure to be with all of you. And while I appreciate the Olivia Pope reference, I really think of more of my, myself more as the Sandra Bullock character in My Name is Crisis. So <laughs> anyway, um, to my wonderful, brilliant panelists, um, I, it is as if I had read your minds or heard your presentations ahead of time because you've touched on a lot of what I um, what have been thinking about and wanted to share tonight. So think a little bit of my presentation as maybe a, a wrap up. Um, I've been trying to be a little bit more of a visual thinker. I do have a presentation, but maybe since we're running um, late, I'll just um, skip right through that. I have a little bit different lens on the pandemic. Um, I know everyone probably on this, um, you know, in our audience and certainly on our panel has been working breathlessly through this pandemic. And I have to admit to probably having many blind spots. Um, I have a terrible memory, uh, not for work, but for things like dates and years and where I spent Thanksgiving in 1995, things like that. But I know exactly where I was one year ago today at this very moment. So at 7.53, it was 12.53 London time and um, on, this, on this very day. And I was in London because I had just taken a job as global head of public affairs for my company, my communications agency. I was meeting my colleagues in the London office. I was gonna give an office-wide presentation to kick off our new focus on global public policy. So and I had just been to a play because it was London and I had a good seat. I was sitting in the second row and the actor who was playing the lead was very famous to British audiences, not to me, but, um, but he was the kind of classically trained actor who really knew how to project, right? Not just his voice, but his saliva. His sp he was spraying all over everywhere. <laughs> And this thing called COVID-19 was in my consciousness enough to make me rethink my good seat and sort of wrap my scarf around my face. So exactly one year ago today, after being sprayed on in the theater in London, I called United Airlines to change my flight to get back home. There would be no big rollout in the London office. There would be no global travel. There would be none of that work to happen. Um, and so what a year it's been. 365 days to the day, devastating, filled with loss, small losses and very large ones too. I think Ada shared some of the data at the beginning of the evening. The headlines, the data are staggering. Women dislocated, leaving the workforce, caring for the children and parents and siblings during the pandemic. So I lead a team of mostly women um, communications is often considered a soft skill and women excel at writing and empathy and client service and as Penny showed us, multitasking. Um, but we've built a really inclusive workplace where women can thrive and lead and focus on issues that matter to us. Education, healthcare, diplomacy, ethical technology. And we're really fortunate to be able to focus on work that has purpose and feels mission driven across a wide array of world organizations. So COVID hits, we're facing possible job cuts, salary cuts, everybody was talking about a recession, we're gonna go off a cliff and I panicked. I would never had to lay people off uh, for lack of work and it was terrifying. There were some really dark days, but business didn't slow down. It was busier than ever and over the past a couple of years, we had aligned our work with working to solve problems that would help create the kind of world that we wanted to live in. Uh, so companies who were scrambling to produce PPE, tests, vaccines, the government needed to communicate um, to deliver public education campaigns, schools scrambled to ensure access, and everybody needed a crisis communications plan. So in addition to having a bad memory, I'm also an optimist. The, men, the women and the men on my team were extraordinary. We helped museums pivot to virtual culture. We had clients do virtual fly-ins to Congress. We held virtual convenings to talk about resilience and plan for the resumption of that in-person world in the future, the other world. 
And women did it with babies on their laps and taking care of toddlers and schooling their elementary and middle schoolers. One of the women on my team, the husband teaches junior high school band. So you could always hear the, the brass section in the background on every conference call. It was, and middle school tuba leaves something to be desired, right? So, um, and even our, the women on our team who had high school and college students who, were, who had no business being at home, they were home and we were feeding and cheering them up. So the women, we were the resilient ones. We set about the business of tracking trends, what would be accelerated by COVID, virtual learning. We knew that we were already doing it. Contact us, listen up technology. When will the drone be able to deliver my groceries? High low dressing. And by that, I mean a silk blouse on top and your SpongeBob pajamas on the bottom. But seriously, I mean, how many of you are still marveling at those marketing emails trying to get you to buy that style edit handbag? Like what's a handbag anymore or high heels? No way. But we're not a monolith as Jacqueline pointed out. Um, you know, there are all manner of, of, of different um, types of working and types of women working in the workplace. And um, Barbara mentioned, um, uh, the prime minister of New Zealand and the, um, you know, there were women's voices were unmasked during COVID-19. They were leading decisive early action around the world. Um, and uh, my uh, people have already talked about Kamala Harris and Stacey Abrams. Women were changing the narrative and they certainly changed the outcome of 2020. Uh, in fact, we were working quite often with women CEOs and women academics. And we had, to Barbara's point, you know, media channels were telling us, don't even pitch us a CEO if it's not a woman. We were not only, not only were our voices being heard, we were being sought out. We were starting to see things changing. changing. But Again, the data uh, around business are staggering. Um, somebody else had mentioned the 70% statistic of the frontline workers being women, such a toll on women. And then if I sort of talk about entrepreneurship for just a moment, in the middle of 2020, uh, the Chamber of Commerce did a lot of research about women's business optimism, which was far lower than men's. They didn't believe that they would be increasing their staff. They didn't plan on increasing their investments in their business. And they believed that their revenues would decrease. This is enormous amount of anxiety, stress, and uncertainty for women in the workplace. So, and, and this is, I, I feel as if I've mapped each of the parts of my presentation to somebody's previous presentation. So I wanna echo what Christy talked about a little bit here, which is this idea of building community and communities of practice. I think one of the critical um, lessons for me and my team in this whole crazy year was really about sharing and learning and forging important connections. Um, you know, as women, we learn very early on about sort of collaborative frameworks, right? We, you know, and as we get older, we do things like book clubs and mommy clubs, and we have workout partners. Um, and we're communal problem solvers. We want to share uh, ideas and our creativity. So yeah, another amazing thing happened, which was that this pandemic sort of galvanized our collect collaborative spirit. There were rough days, no question, but these communities of practice were, were helping us to navigate this. Uh, and we were building them at work. Uh, I was setting up communities of practice with um, like-minded people around my network, but also trying to build them at home because we felt isolated and lonely. I set up a community of practice with other women who just become empty nesters. So, you know, trying to solve, you know, issues in the Middle East and also trying not to feel lonely since there was nobody to cook dinner for. Uh, other women created teaching pods. We all relied on each other um, as a collaboration um, and to build those connections. So is the power of women's voices, the power of women's problem solving and the power of connection. 
So what's next? Um, you know, I think we saw um, with the terrible tragedies with um, George Floyd's death and Breonna Taylor um, this past year, that sometimes these terrible tragedies can be a forcing function for positive change. Um, so with time, maybe we forget some of the pain and loss of this past year and focus on being future forward and the acceleration of change and find ways to make even more inclusive and just places for women to work and help create the conditions for women to succeed through the strength of collaboration and shared ideas. So as we've seen the peeling back of some of our fragile institutions, our government, our schools, um, this could be a catalyst for women's equity. Like I said, I'm an optimist and maybe my terrible memory will help me to put some of the negative away in those high heeled shoe boxes that now live down in the basement. So there's a lot of work to be done. Certainly, thank you so much, Jessica. Um, I too remember where I was last March, exactly uh, feeling very anxious about COVID and the world ahead. And who knew be in this within a year, at least in the US, which, which I, I'm sure no one could have predicted then. Thank you for the reflection and the honesty about the experience of women. About the, to wrap, thank you to all the all today with a few the important ahead heard from our speakers is a lot of opportunity and optimism, but we must do work together. So we want you to um, continue to advocate for sustainable development goal five, continue to advocate for support of the UN by urging your member of Congress to support gender equality worldwide. Our goal is gender equality in every sector by 2030. If you want, you can join our communication list and really get live updates across the year from us by texting women to 30644. Um, you can also, uh, if you'd like to keep up with our community here at UNA USA um, and get invitations to future events, you can um, text GEOS uh, to 30644. Our upcoming um, GEOS event is set for uh, March 18th, where we're talking about Ubuntu rebuilding together. We're going to also meet for another GEOS session on March 23rd on happiness and well-being in cities and communities. Um, thank you so much again for joining us tonight. We are really, really grateful to all of our speakers and the audience that's gathered here. Please do not forget to keep in touch with us. Uh, we have an amazing online community of over 30,000 people that you can register to join for free. We call it the forum. Um, it's at unausa.org. And we look forward to seeing you at a future event. Again, thank you panelists. It's great to see everyone tonight. Bye-bye.